Ooh, another white boy with a podcast. Pronouns, Jim Bro. Another white boy with a podcast. Do you want to see the video? It went viral. Hi, Gains Gurus, and welcome to TMGP, the Muscle Growth Podcast, Episode 8. I am your host, Roscoe, and today we are welcoming biohacker, health guru, and sleep specialist, Riley Jarvis, onto the show for the second portion of his two-part episodes. Riley is a sleep consultant who has helped high performers achieve more out of their personal and work life using cutting-edge scientific lab testing, strategies, and techniques. To hear more about Riley and get his first portion of this two-part episode, please feel free to check out TMGP Episode 7 for more sleep-improving related value. In today's episode, we can look forward to sleeping tips, achieving sleep nirvana, optimizing sleep and recovery, improving your sleeping environment, waking up rituals, circadian rhythms, advanced sleeping techniques and hacks, falling asleep faster, sleep supplements, sleep tracking, and more. Let's jump right into part two of Riley Jarvis on TMGP. Do you mind chatting about sleep optimization and some of your tips for optimizing sleep and how and how we can make our environment better for sleep and th- that kind of thing. Sure. So sleep has many different forms. Uh, we have deep sleep. We have REM sleep. Ideally, we want to be able to fall asleep fast and stay asleep for, you know, seven to nine hours or whatever we need uninterrupted. Because when we wake up in the middle of the night, that is going to have a negative impact on how we feel the next day and our recovery. We're not going to be able to recover as much for testosterone to build muscle and everything else. So Um, what I call it is sleep nirvana. What that is, is the ability to fall asleep within five to 10 minutes, stay asleep uninterrupted for seven to nine hours and wake up with an abundance of energy that lasts all day long without the need to take any stimulants whatsoever. And when you hit that place, recovery is going to be magnificent for you during the deep sleep phases. We're going to get human growth hormone release, which is extremely important for recovery of our muscles. Um, and just muscle, muscle growth, pro- protein synthesis in general, testosterone, and so, and so many other things. Um, and we're just not going to rely on caffeine pills to just get through the day. The second thing is for sleep optimization, what we can do. So first is some of those supplements that I mentioned. But for sleep environment, there's a couple things. I'll start with the low-hanging fruit first. The first thing is we want to have a cold bedroom um, environment temperature. Celsius, mm-hmm. I would say 16 to 18, it's cold, but just scientifically, they show this is best. We also want it to be pitch black. So ideally, you would want it to be so black where you can't see your hand in front of you. You have to be realistic at the same time. And if you're not that, get as close to that as you can. But having your bedroom also in a separate area from where you do your work. So your bedroom associates your brain to sleep. It's kind of your safe haven. They commit like a ritual. And then your work, your desk will be outside of there. And then creating that as a separate ritual. And people think they can use their willpower and stuff like that to get over it. But they just show them through science that over time, it just makes sleep more difficult that way. Another thing that you can do is we want to make sure along the lines of light is making sure that there's no um, light being emitted from electronics inside of our bedroom. So things like cable boxes, fans, alarm clocks, any lights that are turned on. We have these light receptors around our eyes that are called melopsin receptors, and they can detect light at a pretty subtle level. So even if you have these lights shining in your bedroom, they can det- you know reduce your sleep quality in some way. So instead, what we want to do is ensure that our um, sleep environment is good. Put on like duct tape, masking tape, whatever you have to do to keep those covered. The next thing is we can use a smell. So like a diffuser with essential oils, the two in particular are lavender to relax. And the other one is frankincense. And this, this is probably the best essential oil that you can get for just general properties, detoxification and everything else for the body, low inflammation. So I like to combine those two together. Plus it smells just really good. Put that on for a timer, keep it on all night, see what works best for you. Um, What else you can do for sleep environment? One hour, two hours ideally before you go to sleep, you want to get blue light blocking glasses. The best brand for this? Exactly. The best brand for this, there's many on the market, but again, if you're looking for best results, they're called uh, True Dark. And they're called the True Dark Twilight Classics. And they're red, they make you look like X-Men, and they're not, you know very comfortable in the beginning or 
you know, to see the world in red is not so comfortable, but you kind of get used to it. And then over a while you prefer to put them on because you, there's just less light coming into your eyes. Once you do that, you can also use, um, Another application for your computer called irisTech.co. This will reduce blue light from your computer screen, from your MacBook, even from your phone, screen flickering rate, and all these other different things. So that's one. Equally, it's all about the morning routine. So when we first wake up, we want to expose our eyes to sunlight, uh, usually within about an hour of waking up. And if it's cloudy outside, we want about 30 minutes of the outside exposure. If it's sunny outside, we only need about 10 or 15 minutes. Look up at the sun, don't wear sunglasses. Obviously, don't look directly at the sun too long, that'll hurt your eyes. But if you can have at least, you know, look 30 degrees away, look up, look down, just try and get as much sun into your eyes as you can. Once our body gets that sun, that sun goes into our master clock, tells our master clock, or our master clock tells our hormones and our organs, okay, guys, it's time to start turning on. Once they know when to turn on, the timer is set. So once it's 12 hours or whatever circadian rhythm is, there's genetic components to that too, then it knows when to fall asleep. Now our bodies are kind of these outdated, you know, monkey machines, and we have to give it all the right input as much as possible so it knows when to sleep. It doesn't know when to do it automatically because we're we live in a, a day and age where, you know, our bodies are not too much different from our ancestral environment where we you know, our biology adapted to light from the sun, from the moon, or from potentially fire. And that was it. But we have these artificial forms of light that our, our mind is not used to and our body isn't used to. And it's causing us a lot of issues. And it's called the Savannah Principle. If anyone's interested, there is a, an evolutionary psychology book called Why Beautiful People Have More Daughters. And it's fascinating. It talks a lot about these things and why we do certain things in modern day society. Um, it's it's interesting because it brings kind of this pop science um, thing to it and explains a lot, a lot of the reasons why. So it's one I recommend. But um, yeah, just focusing on these core principles. There's a ton more that we can look at, but just in terms of environment, these are quick quick ones people can start using. That's epic, and and I'm so excited to to start implementing some of those. I know that we also mentioned some. Um, less low hanging fruit ones like uh, mouth taping and wearing a wearing a mask Let, let's go into some of the more advanced techniques if you will for for sleep optimization sure so a couple of them would be um hitting them off once you do these low hanging fruit things the ones i said before then we can look at these other ones the first one would be an epsom salt bath before we go to bed um so epsom salt is magnesium relaxes the body also from the heat of a hot bath our body is going to slingshot in the other direction and actually go, go to a more cooler internal environment. When that happens, we're actually able to sleep better because while we sleep, we want our body temperature to cool down, not heat up. The second thing is um, we can wear socks to bed. For some people, that is shown to improve sleep quality. The third one is we can raise the head of our bed where our pillow is, like our actual bed frame up by about three inches. And this is going to help us sleep because while we sleep, there's something known as our lymphatic system. It kind of acts as the drainage or these internal, these internal garbage truck cleaners that come through our body. And so if you're sleeping flat, it's hard for that kind of drainage process to happen. But if we sleep on an angle, we're, we're slightly on an incline, it kind of drains potentially these toxins or at least helps get rid of those from our brain. It goes more towards, you know, um, exit passageways through urine, stool, um, and things like that. So that is also shown to help improve sleep quality as well. You can also wear a sleep mask is really nice. Uh, Manta Sleep is a good one. You can do things like um, frequencies. So Brain.fm is an app on your phone. Um, and you can wear headphones just like we are now. And you can listen to the sleep mode for, you know, 30 minutes, one hour before you go to sleep. That's one. You can also get an acu uh, acupressure mat. And it's a, basically a bunch of these spikes on a mat that will release endorphins. A really good company for that is called the Shakti mat. It is it is painful when you get on it, but you lie in there for 20 minutes and your body completely relaxes. And sometimes myself and other clients have actually fallen asleep on the mat because before you know it, it's like you get a massage all these um, endorphins company, you you really start to feel your body going into a deeper and deeper state, especially if you combine that, if you want to start stacking things, combine the brain.fm sleep mode with the um, 
acupressure mat and you'll get a lot of benefits um, that way. Just try not to fall asleep or you'll wake up a couple hours later with, with spike holes all over your back, which has happened a few times to me. But it's a good thing and those are usually good sleeps. But um, those I would say are some of the more advanced without going too advanced that people can start using. It would having a slightly thicker pillow or two, would that be enough to get those benefits or would you actually want your bed to be at a angle going, going down entirely? It's a good question. I think, you know, putting your, um, the head of your bed, like the frame actually up on blocks or whatever you can do, everyone has a different setup would be good. I don't think the, you know, a higher cloth, potentially it would, I mean, who knows, but your body in a way, instead of just you know, the top part of your body going up kind of all has to go up in unison. And I think that's okay. why the, having the mattress elevated is probably best. Okay. And what kind of elevation would you say? Like five degrees, two degrees, 10 degrees? I would elevate the head of your bed up by three inches. So, you know, it'd probably be, you know, f- five degrees, seven degrees, something like that. Okay. So it wouldn't be just sliding on. Yeah. Yeah. Have to, you don't want to slide. Yeah. You don't want to sleep on a slide exactly. while you sleep. Exactly. Okay, cool. Um, how would you recommend falling asleep faster? So falling asleep faster, um, a couple things. So make sure you do the thing in the morning where you expose your eyes to sunlight. Make sure you wear blue light blocking glasses two hours before sleep. Reduce all blue light as much as you can before you go to bed. Um, make sure your body's relaxed, do deep breathing, meditation, whatever you have to do to make sure you're your mind's really quieted down. Also in terms of work, you want like three hour evening routine to truly wind down because if you're working until right before sleep or looking at a screen, that's going to be difficult to really settle down. So you can do all these advanced things, but if you don't do these basic ones, then it's, it's going to be so much more difficult to fall asleep. Now in terms of the supplements you can use to fall asleep, melatonin, of course, you can use 5-HTP, L-theanine, GABA, These are some of the quickest ones that you can use to get to sleep and some of those relaxation tools to fall asleep as well. Also, not having caffeine anytime after 12 p.m. is generally a good go-to as well. Um, In terms of those supplements, I think, did we mention CBD as as well in our our kind of um, topic discussion? No, not yet. So CBD you can use, but it's case by case for everybody. Some people it works great for others. It doesn't. And so I never tell people to take it just because it's something that it's a hit or miss for some people, but it it may help improve your sleep to get to sleep. But in terms of sleep quality, you know, anything within that family is shown to reduce REM sleep. Same with alcohol too. It might feel like you're getting better sleep, but you're not conscious of it. But if you set yourself up to a sleep study or a sleep tracker, you'll notice the sleep will actually go down over time, like on average, not just one night, but just over time. And how do you recommend staying asleep for longer? So staying asleep longer, a big one is going to be uh, blue light. So that's major. Also, a big one is their subconscious mind. For a lot of people, they dream. For a lot of people, their minds are racing. And while they're sleeping, you could have a thought that is in a dream that causes your heart rate to elevate, your cortisol to increase, and that's going to cause you to wake up at 3 a.m. So in order to reduce that, we want to make sure before we go to sleep, our brain is almost completely emptied out because it's when it's on that empty tank, it's like a computer. When there's all these applications on a computer that's taking up all the RAM and all, all the bandwidth, and then we go to sleep in that way, it's got to deal with all this excessive stuff. So we want our mind to kind of be like a blank slate before we go to bed. And one of the best ways to do that, 90 minutes before bed, we take our journal and we, as a cathartic exercise, we write down everything that comes to mind. It could be a drawing, it could be a to-do list, it could just be a random word. You want it to be a truly free-flowing activity. And when we do that, you'll find at the end of the exercise, for some people it might take 5, 10, 15 minutes, maybe longer, you will find your mind is a lot more empty. And because it's emptied down, now your brain has more bandwidth to start consolidating memories from the past, recovering, and everything else. So that's been shown to improve it. To also fall asleep, stay asleep longer, um, a big one people don't realize is blood sugar. So when our blood sugar, we want our blood sugar to kind of be like uh, up and down just slightly. So like plus one, minus one, homeostasis. Where we wake up though is if somebody's blood sugar goes like plus five, minus five, or plus 10, minus 10. 
And how that happens is before we go to sleep, we have a bunch of like sugary foods, could be a dessert or even dinner time. We have too much or just in general, our body is just so, you know, not insulin um, sensitive, you could say, or is not adapt. It's, it's just not adapted to blood sugar in general. And it goes with the cortisol too. So what happens when our cortisol comes up, we need insulin to bring it back down from our pancreas. When our blood sugar is low, let's say it's at minus five, minus 10, we need cortisol and adrenaline to bring it back up. Now, our body is always trying to do homeostasis to go in the middle. Now, if we're doing this up and down and our body's only used to like plus one, minus one, now we have to tap into these backup generators in our body. And it kind of sounds the alarm bells like, uh oh, there's an emergency that's happening right now. We have to tap into these backup reserves when it doesn't have to be. And it's just going to stress our body out more. And once that happens, our blood sugar goes low. We need cortisol and adrenaline to bring it back up. Cortisol and adrenaline will cause us to wake up in the middle of the night. So this won't be something where you wake up one hour into sleep. It might be. But for a lot of people, it's waking up at 2, 3, 4 a.m. in the middle of the night. Another thing that goes on top of that is the first four hours of sleep, someone sleeps eight hours, it's more dominant to be deep sleep. In the second four-hour phase of sleep, it's more dominant to be REM sleep. And so if we're waking up in the middle of the night, we're going to be tapping into that later four-hour REM sleep, which we need to feel mentally recharged, fully recovered, sharp, be able to get you know things done and stuff like that. If we don't get that, then we're going to resort to caffeine, which is going to stress out our body more, elevate our cortisol and adrenaline, and that downward cycle continues. The other one why people wake up in the middle of the night is just going to the bathroom too much. So the obvious one is don't drink liquids, you know, two hours, three hours before bedtime. Try and save more of those throughout the daytime. Don't just save it till the end of the day when you feel thirsty. The next one is um, we want to make sure our hormones are optimized. And when our hormones are optimized, we'll be able to retain our fluids in our body easier, meaning we won't have to wake up to go to the bathroom. A quick hack excuse me, you can do for this though, is you can use pink, um, pink Himalayan sea salt. Yes, but I'm more towards Celtic salt or Redmond's real salt. And when we do this, our body will be able to hold on to those fluids a lot easier. It's a hormone called aldosterone. And once we do this, we'll find we don't wake up as much in the middle of the night. So are you telling me that my epic adventures and my really cool dreams are potentially not optimal and that it would be better to to wake up having just been blank and you know that gray or nothing uh kind of feeling sometimes it's a good question dream like if we can hack our dreams and go into lucid dreaming states where we're flying you know we all know what that deep dream feels like and when we're in those states chances are we're sleeping very well because our brain is in that deep sleep in that recovery state and everything else it's more so when we have these stressed out feelings um, before we go to sleep and those manifest into nightmares or manifest into negative things that spike our cortisol and then cause us to wake up in the middle of the night. So I, what I would, I would argue that if we are able to remove those negative feelings before we go to sleep, that almost leaves more room for the positive dreams like lucid dreaming, the, the dreams that we do want to have to go into those deeper sleep states. Um, because, you know, bad dreams, you know, if we have them time to time, sure. But if it's happening consistently, there's something probably happening in your subconscious that you haven't fully released or processed yet. And writing stuff down as a short-term approach, I mean, that can work. But making that a consistent thing can be good. Obviously, people can do forms of therapy, somatic experiencing, EMDR, EFT, stuff like that. But um, that's a long Okay, discussion. so you're actually saying that um, lucid dreaming where, where you're having it like – you're in the dream you for example flying or doing something really cool like that you've got some superpowers yeah like those are my favorite dreams you're saying that that's actually a sign of great, right? of good sleep typically it can be not all the time but like if you wake up in a lucid dreaming state you might find your eyes are watering and you just had the best sleep ever just anecdotally that's true in terms of the science, lucid dreaming has sometimes been shown to be uh, not as deep sleep states, but most of the time it is. Okay. And as for you mentioned that nightmares are bad because of the spikes in cortisol and waking up. If I'm having nightmares, for example, and they don't wake me up, is that still really bad or is it fine because it was still lucid and I didn't wake up? 
It's a good question. I think if you are, and you also have to define like what is waking up because we not we might not be consciously waking up, but we could have gone from a deeper sleep state to a lighter sleep phase because of that happening. We we might not even know it. So it, you kind of you can't judge until you wake up and you have to see well how do I feel? Did I have nightmares and I'm full of energy, or did, did I have nightmares and I'm not full of energy? And it's usually the latter where people are like, man, I had nightmares last night i could not sleep like this one thing was giving me anxiety and it's always the most random thing it's just this basic thing you're worried about and it leads on this whole um it's almost like someone takes magic mushrooms and goes down that trip whatever frame of mind you went into it with usually will manifest into something bigger or whatever you know you're holding on to or avoiding or something like that so um i think it could go both ways but i don't know exactly so you've just got to have the philosophy from timon and pumba of hakuna matata uh, it means no worries Okay. That's right. That's cool. <laughs> and uh, can you get back to your REM sleep quickly? Like, for example, if you do wake up in the middle of the night and need to go pee, can you then mm. uh, get back to that REM sleep quickly? For example, what I tend to do is if I do wake up in the night, I'm always like very um, aware that I should be asleep. And what I try and do is, uh, you can tell me if this is completely ridiculous and if it's just placebo, but again, we know placebo can work in some instances, is I actually keep my eyes mm. as shut as possible and try not to let light and things mm. in. And I go and I, and I do my business all while like squinting as hard as I can. And then I find that that doesn't wake me up too much provided that that everything goes without needing to turn on a light or, or anything like that. And then I can get back to sleep very quickly. Yeah. So with that, um, it's ideal to not have any lights on if you wake up to go to the bathroom. And some people are really good at seeing, feeling, feeling the dark where they have to go. Um, and that's like most ideal if you have to go to the bathroom and ideally not turn your light on. Cause some people do that when they really don't have to. Um, and that's definitely going to affect your REM sleep. I think that's probably one of the worst things you can do is turn the light on in the middle of the night. Cause that's going to stimulate cortisol when cortisol should be low. It's going to reduce your melatonin and just a lot of other things. And then that'll just lead to more, um, you know, conscious awake brain waves. Then you're going to have to get back into the rhythm in that way. So the best thing is if you wake up in the middle of the night, try and go back to sleep. There's a couple things here though. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back asleep, the worst thing to do is just sitting there looking at the ceiling, thinking about the thoughts and those thoughts lead to more thoughts and other thoughts. And it's, it's just you with your thoughts. You yeah. spiral. And so in that case, to distract yourself with other things outside of your thoughts can be one of the fastest ways to fall back asleep. So there was an old adage of um, uh, this woman who would go in and the, she would say when she wakes up in the middle of the night, the best thing she would do is just go sweep in the dark and she would sweep and sweep until she felt tired and then she would go back to bed. It, you know, it goes back a long time and I don't think that's, you know, it's a hundred percent true, but what you can do is, for example, like an audiobook, like, or a relaxing meditation or something like that in the background while the lights are off, you hit the play button that's playing, maybe set it on a timer, which a lot of these apps have, and then, you know, set it for one or two hours and then you'll fall asleep and that thing will, will naturally go off too. But, um, that's really good when you can just listen to someone else's narration or someone else's voice. That's great. Now, if you can get to sleep pretty fast, but it still disrupted your sleep, if it's possible to set your alarm clock or extend your, your wake up time by like, you know, an hour if you can, an hour and a half if you can, um, that's another one of the best ways to extend REM sleep is just improve, increase the time that you're, you're actually asleep. So on that one, if I was to so say, for example, this morning, I woke up half an hour early, mm -hmm. like half an hour before my alarm and I woke up feeling quite energized, is it best to then get up and start your day? Or is it best to be like, oh, I've got half an hour left to go back, try and get back to sleep? What is your recommendation on waking up slightly early or an hour early even? Do you recommend trying to force yourself back to sleep? Or do you recommend getting up and, and getting out of bed and getting your day started? Good question. Um, so if you wake up, and you have energy, then it's best to get up and get your day started. The reason why is because we have, you know, different sleep rhythms, different sleep waves, and our sleep cycles run in 90 minute cycles. So we go from lighter sleep to REM sleep, deep sleep, non-REM sleep, and the cycle repeats itself. So we go up, we go down, we go up, we go down. 
if we wake up and we have energy, chances are we probably woke up at the end of a more wakeful sleep cycle. And that sleep cycle probably ended. And, and there's a couple of different things. It's just more the fact that your body had energy. Then you, um, you were probably towards the end of that. Now, if you wake up and you don't have energy, then it might be best for you to get more sleep if you're awake through a you know, good portion of the night. But if you just wake up, you know, in a half an hour early, an hour early, it's probably a good chance that you're, that's when your body should be waking up because it's got enough sleep as it should. Maybe you need another full, you know, 90 minute sleep cycle. But in that case, it would be disadvantageous to sleep for 30 minutes because you would be going to a deep sleep state. And then in half an hour, you'd be in the middle of that deep sleep state and you would feel groggy for the rest of that day. Okay. And uh, sorry, I had a question now on, on waking up. Um, Oh, so if you wake up in the night or you, you just can't get to sleep at all and like no matter what you try, you try to listen to an audio book, you try whatever and you're not falling asleep, is it good to just stay still, close your eyes and just lie there, just just rest as hard as you can or are you completely wasting your time should you go try and be productive or, or something like that? If you absolutely can't mm-hmm. get to sleep, what, what would you say? to people that are suffering with insomnia and and no matter what they try, they try the supplements, they're trying everything, but that particular night their sleep is just two hours, for example, lying awake in bed and then starting to spiral on stress and about not being able to sleep and they've got a big day the next day, for example. What do you suggest to those people? Mm. In those cases, like if you've tried everything and you still can't sleep and like you said, you've tried all the supplements, you've tried all the hacks, and you still can't, and you gave it, uh, you know, a really high fighting chance, then it, in those cases, yes, it's best to get up, make the best use of that day. And this well, is where night. supplements can help you because if you wake up or that night and, you know, using supplements to, because re- now your body's going to be more inflamed, your mind's going to be more foggy. It's probably going to be a day where you need more caffeine, you need more stuff to focus, you need to take some stuff to lower body inflammation. That day, you're probably going to crave a lot of sugary foods because your hunger hormones, leptin and ghrelin are just going to be off. So we all have those days sometimes. Um, but as long as that's not the standard and it's just sort of a one-off thing, then in those cases, you can um, you know, do something like that and then maybe have a nap in the afternoon and then plan for the next day go to sleep like a one or two hours early and you probably will want to because you might be exhausted that day. So can you, uh, that's a very interesting topic uh, now that you mentioned going to bed slightly earlier. Can you make up for a bad night's sleep the following night by adding an extra hour or two onto your sleep for the next day? Or uh, like maybe maybe you can't completely make up for it, but can you make up parts of, of the missed sleep, the sleep debt? as it's called, I believe. Yeah. So they say sleep debt, like a bank account. Like, you know, if if I lost three hours of sleep, could I sleep another three hours and get it back and feel the same? Matthew Walker in the book, Why We Sleep, he he looked at some of this and the answer is basically, no, we can't. But if you, like people know anecdotally, if they didn't get a good sleep, they woke up and then they went to bed earlier, they do feel a lot better the next day compared to the, 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 the day they didn't get sleep. But in one interesting finding is, if you did not sleep well, let's say on a Thursday night, even if you slept well on Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, by Sunday, you still would not be fully recovered. And we're talking about a Thursday sleep, like where you really didn't sleep well. You went out, you drank alcohol. It will take you a couple of days to recover. And even then, you won't fully um, be 100% mentally recharged and compared to if you didn't have that in the first place. So recovery takes longer than people think. I totally, totally agree with you on that one. Let's while talking about Matt Walker, it, it is Matt Walker, right? Let mm-hmm. let's discuss his. Uh, I've done. I did his uh, masterclass on sleep. I've also found it very interesting, and he's brilliant, and he's one of the top sleep scientists in the world. Um, however, I found that some of the data that he was using for his information were sleep studies done, um, where they basically took two different groups of people. I don't know, again, why they only use two. I know that it's very difficult to get participants for studies. But basically what they did was they they did the participants and they said, here, you guys sleep, get eight hours of sleep. And then the other group, they forced them to wake up after five hours. And I was thinking that there must be better ideas for 
trying to figure out what the best sleep is like i think it's quite obvious that if you're forcing someone out of their sleep mid sleep that that was going to be really bad and the study showed that that was really really bad for their health for their well-being for all those biomarkers and everything would it not be best to try and figure out what and basically they were trying to decide is five hours or eight hours sleep better um but I think like we discussed, mm. for some people, five hours actually might be better than eight hours. Like eight hours could be oversleeping for some people. And I'm not saying that you must try and uh, get as little sleep as possible. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is, obviously, if you're forcing someone out of their their sleep, that's, that's not going to be good. Would it not be better to do a study where you let people sleep as long as they want to and then and then seeing how different hours of sleep per different people affects them and then having kind of like a more person dependent uh, study yeah i think that would be way better those studies might exist too but waking people up you know whether with an alarm clock at a certain time or with um you know when a nurse will come in and wake you up like an actual sleep study plus an environment like that isn't your your actual sleep like you're sleeping on your back when someone might sleep on their side or their stomach it's not their house. It's not their mattress. It's like going to a hotel and not sleeping well. So to, and that's where sleep trackers like an aura ring and stuff like that are really good. Sure. It's not as accurate as a sleep study, but we can detect trends. Plus it's their regular environment day to day. And then when we take averages of that, we can get a couple of years of data instead of one night of data in a sterile hospital bed. So I think there's where it has a lot of advantages, but, um, you know, on that note, I think it's, uh, it's a good way to do it. And what I should also say is everyone has a different chronotype. So everyone's biology genetically um, is more of a nighttime person or more of a morning person. And this could be plus or minus usually about two hours throughout the day. So some people genetically uh, should be going to bed earlier and waking up earlier. Other people should be going to bed later and waking up later. And if they don't follow that exact schedule, then it's very possible their overall performance and well-being won't be as good as it could be. Okay, let, let, uh, chronotype, I think, is incredibly important. So let's let's elaborate some more on that. And would you say, like, what is more important, like listening to your, or also how do you find out your chronotype? I think we mentioned something about biomarkers and DNA tests. So let's get into that as well as what would you say is more important, sticking to your chronotype? or sticking to a consistent um, time to go to bed? What, or, or they're both equally important? What, what was your thoughts on all of that? Mm. So number one, what, what is your chronotype? Well, your chronotype is basically, think of it as your sleep rhythm or um, another thing is like your sleep animal sign is what they call it. So it's basically like everyone, they say to sleep, t you know, eight hours. They might say, you know, go to bed at 10 p.m., wake up at 6 a.m. And that's great for a lot of people. And that seems to be the average on a typical work week. Um, and then they also say for every one hour of sleep before midnight equals two hours of sleep after midnight. There's there's a lot of truth to that, too. But a lot of them speak in um, a lot of platitudes and generic cookie cutter solutions that aren't for everybody. So you're genetically um, different than your friend of when you should wake up and when you should go to sleep. So what we can actually do is um, the most optimal solution is finding out what your chronotype is. So how do you know what time you should go to bed and what time you should wake up? You can do a quiz. It's called the power of when quiz.com. It's one by Dr. Bruce. It's a free one. You can find out what your sleep animal sign is that way. It will give you sort of a schedule to follow. Um, that's in alignment with that. The, the best thing. And the second thing you can do is um, a genetic test. And when you do a genetic test, you'll know for sure, are you more of a nighttime person or are you more of a morning person? And that's one thing that I do with my clients. And when we're able to do it that way, we're able to find out exactly how should we um, design their routine, their morning routine, their afternoon routine, their evening routine based on these times. And then when we find out those exact times, then we make it that consistent. So we, we find out what their type is first. We know what the best time they should go to sleep. When we look at the aura ring and stuff to, to detect these trends, and then we make that the consistent schedule of when they go to bed. But this is where it's an issue for people. Because of their job, because of modern day society, we're forced to wake up extremely early. But the majority of us are actually night owls, um, nighttime um, dominant. So as a result of that, we, our environment, we've been adapted to this environment to wake up, go to work, 
extremely early and then maybe go to bed early, but actually we'd be better off sleeping in a couple extra hours, going to bed a couple hours later, and we would feel so much better as, as a result of that. But you know, for people that have freedom or a job that designs to do that, they can do that, wake up within an alarm clock, um, honoring their body's natural rhythms and doing it that way. But that would be the best way to do it. Figure out what you are and then be consistent around what that actually was. Absolutely. And um, I would love to chat to you after this and see if I can get one of those uh, genetic tests through, through your company. Yeah. What's the name of your company again? The sleep, the sleep consultant. com Is that correct? Okay. Yep. And they That's do the, the genetic tests and you can tell me exactly what genetically I should be doing. Exactly. So I, when I look at the genetic tests, I'll be able to look at and see nighttime person, morning person, and many other things in your biology, for example, like the foods you should be eating, the exercise you should be doing. Um, even interesting things like in terms of genetics and behavioral stuff like IQ, EQ, creativity, educational attainment, language ability, mathematic ability, just stuff that's interesting to know and then stuff is, that's more vital for your performance day to day. Okay, I'm super keen to to hopefully get get that done. Uh-huh. Um, but like, you know, obviously people are social creatures and on the weekends and things. So say they have an early chronotype where they should be going to bed at 10 or 11 or 12, whatever it may be. But then on Friday, Saturday, they go out partying until or socializing or whatever they want to do until early hours of the morning, that kind of thing. How bad is that for, for them? And would it be better for them to maybe shift their chronotype a little bit to be slightly later um, to maybe midnight on, on most nights and then on the Friday and Saturday only go out to one? Then it's only one hour shifted, for example, on the weekend mm-hmm. because your body probably doesn't give give any uh, – I'm sorry, I'm trying to find nice words for it um, – doesn't care about uh, the day of the week for example. So Mm -hmm. do you think it would be best to try and like, if you are going to be going out on the weekends, I'm not saying you need to, or you should, but if you are, would it be best to try and have a slightly more aligned sleep time? Good question. And I would say yes. And the more, the less of a variation, kind of like the blood sugar that you can have with your natural sleep rhythms. And then let's say the weekend comes around and let's say you extend it by just one or two hours opposed to, you know, typically going to bed at 10 PM and then doing a weekend bender at till five, 5 AM. Oh. That's going to take a really long time for you to recover. And for some people that's a week and they know exactly what that feels like. And then they're doing it again the next night and the next night. And they wonder why they never feel 100%. It's a lot better to stay within a narrow window of what your natural time is. However, if your body is genetically a morning person, you should be going to bed at 9, 30, 10 PM. And then the weekends, you know, you go to sleep at 1 a.m. That can be a bit of an issue, but people usually morning larks know who they are because when they go out they with their friends, they're they get tired and they and they can't drink as much or they have to go to sleep earlier. So if you look back over the last 10, 20 years, especially in particular, like earlier on, um, not not when you were like in the middle and your body was in puberty and stuff like that, and as you were developing, because you know, that's just a different time hormonally and everything. But once things are stable, you know, past the age of like 20, 21, then trying to figure out what exactly um, you are. It's not always the case, but it sometimes is. Um, but instead of just guessing, testing, again, can be the best way. You mentioned a very important topic there that I think is neglected by a large portion of the world, which is alcohol and drink. Um Do you mind just elaborating and telling us, and I know how bad alcohol is, and I'm sure you know how bad it is, just telling the the audience exactly how bad it is for your sleep and for your hormones and your body, your brain, everything, basically. Yeah, for sure. Um, If people want to take a deep dive on this, you can just listen to the Andrew Huberman, just put in YouTube, Andrew Huberman alcohol and he goes like two and a half hours of all this and you will never never want to drink alcohol again after what he talks about but just some high points um in terms of sleep alcohol is going to directly reduce your REM sleep which is like the quality of your REM sleep and a lot of people will drink to kind of um put the brakes on before they go to bed to quiet their mind in something but again first principles where does that calmness come from when we drink alcohol well that's a neurotransmitter in our body in our brain that's called GABA. 
Now, we can naturally do GABA without the negative effects of alcohol. And again, there's stuff in the body that's happening with our heart rate and stuff like that that makes us feel relaxed. But in terms of the brain, um, if we supplement with pharma GABA, we're, we're, we're putting the brakes and we're slowing down the, anxi- the anxious thoughts of our brain um, without the negative effects of alcohol. So I'm not saying don't drink. You still have to enjoy life and everything else. And it depends on what your goals are and everything else. And I'm not telling anybody what to do. But if you can keep alcohol down to a minimum, you're you're going to get better sleep as much as possible. If you are going to have alcohol, having a supplement with it called NAC or glutathione or um, you can have like uh, charcoal, like coconut charcoal is a really good one to minimize those effects. And it, would you take that every day as a potent antioxidant? Yep. I'll go to Thion. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to take as a potent antioxidant. Um, now, if your goal is muscle growth, I'll give a quick hack here. It's a bit more advanced. On days you work out, you do not want to take glutathione or NAC. That's yeah. going to reduce your muscle gains. The same thing is after a workout, you don't want to have a cold shower, cold immersion. You always want to expose to heat or like a sauna or something like that. So on days that we do not work out, we can have glutathione and stuff if you know if we, if we want to grow muscle. Um, the other thing is glutathione as a supplement does not pass the blood-brain barrier. NAC called N-acetylcysteine does. So I like to go for NAC because it's a bit more um, downstream and we can target that. Plus it passes the blood-brain barrier. I like to combine that sometimes with glutathione. Again, glutathione has different forms. So you have liposomal, S-glutathione, acetyl, um, and stuff like that. S-glutathione is usually the best. It's typically oral, but um, you can do ones that are spray or gels that you put in your mouth too, but um, it's all good. But combining that with NEC is good at the same time. Don't want to have too, too much of it, but you can have higher amounts over over time, but especially around drinking. Absolutely. I think, uh, I hope that that information doesn't get used uh, as an excuse to drink more, but I'm sure that that'll help the people that are going to have hopefully only one or two. So yeah, we mentioned uh, in our little pre-discussion about mouth taping and sleeping with the fan on, sleeping naked, uh, sleeping with uh, fabrics like cotton and silk, not chemicals, and using natural detergent. And uh, the last one, some uh, plants, like you mentioned, devil's claw and top three plants for sleep. Do you mind just touching on, on those topics briefly? Sure. Uh, so starting with our environment going a bit more advanced, we can use an air purifier. Those are really good. You can go from cheap. You'll probably have to replace the filter frequently to one that's more advanced. Uh, advanced one that's good is like Austin Air, or you can get one that's called the Air Molecule. Both of these are you know upwards of five hundred to a thousand dollars, but a great investment. And the filters in there will sometimes last three to five years, so you actually save money in a lot of ways. Um, and they're just such great companies with great reputations. Second one is plants. We can get uh, different kinds of plants um, for sleep. I mean, you could just simply Google uh, plants to help me sleep better because everywhere in the world has different vegetation. But um, Devil's Claw and a couple of these other plants, particularly that look like cactuses, that don't maybe aesthetically look like a jungle. Um, depends on what, what you're looking for, but they um, can be really beneficial as well. Going onwards, though, uh, mouth taping can be very good because we're breathing through our nose. It's not for everybody. That self-experimentation, seeing what works best for you. Um, sleep masks are really good. You can also look at things like um, uh, tur- an advanced one is you know EMF, so electromagnetic frequencies. When you go to sleep, put your phone in airplane mode. You can also set your Wi-Fi in your house on a timer. So when you fall asleep... Um, Wi-Fi is off. When you wake up, Wi-Fi is on. A really cool device for this and kind of stuff that happens um, in the air, it's called Somavedic, S-O-M-A-V-E-D-I-C. And they're the kind of this uh, cool device that goes beside your bed that really helps with the EMFs to reduce them and so much more. So that's another cool little gadget. Um, and sleeping naked? <laughs> You know, sleeping naked is good too. So um, again, case by case, ideally we want our bodies to be cool while we sleep. So when we sleep naked without big sweaters and stuff like that on us, um, 
that will be more prone to a good sleep and everything. For some people, just psychologically too, they feel more free when they sleep naked and that's good too. But for other people, maybe they feel vulnerable, um, not as safe while they sleep. So when they dream or while they sleep, that won't be as good. So that's where sort of that personal preference comes in. But the core principle of we want our internal body temperature to be cool while we sleep. We don't want to be sweating while we sleep. Um, that's going to be a really good one to go with. Now, if people want to, you know, keep their body cool, they can use two devices. On the cheaper end, you have something called a chili pad, which is kind of like blast cold air under your sheets while you sleep. And the second one, which is a lot more expensive, is called an eight sleep. And that's kind of like a thing that sits on your mattress and in real time tracks your body temperature, will give you a sleep score and will essentially... um provide coolness and it, it separates the bed into two. So if you have a partner in bed, one can go warm, one can go cooler and you can really customize your sleep that way. But that's multiple thousands of dollars. One day, one day. <laughs> one day. Um, the, uh, the other gadget you mentioned was sense.ai. Yeah. So it's called sensei. So sens.ai. And what they do is they're really revolutionary and they just came out probably in the last six months or so. And they've been working on this device for a long time, but they will help your brain um, become more calm, become more peaceful, become more focused um, by using something called neurofeedback, um, which is really pe people can just Google and see what this is, but it's kind of um, rewiring your brain sort of in a good way with your brain waves to give yourself more of the good brain waves. Um, other things such as something called heart rate variability as a trainer to increase your heart rate variability, to become more peaceful, have better thoughts, um, make your body more resilient. You have something else in there called photobiomodulation, which is, again, it's this headset that goes on your head and does all these at one time while you kind of play games on your phone and it kind of acts like red light, um, for your brain to help um, shift it more efficiently and to give your brain more energy and everything that goes along with it. So did you mention um, fabrics and, and detergents yet? So f detergents, we always want to make sure it's natural. Anything that's synthetic that we put onto our body is likely going to go through our skin into our bloodstream and our body it's going to absorb these toxins in our fat cells or adipose tissues. So what we want to do is reduce any source of that as much as possible and have, I, and there's extremes with this. And I, again, we have to be ideal uh, or realistic, but you can use natural detergent is always going to be best. Um, having clothes that are um, naturally just not with a lot of chemicals on it. You can buy clothes that are EMF protectants. Um, there's many different clothing lines for this. And then you can also just get clothes in general that don't ha like emit or um, pick up a lot of, you know, just things from the air, you know, cotton and linen's all good. And this is where personal preference comes in. Like how does the clothes feel? How does it breathe? Things like that. Um, but beyond that, just making sure it's, it's all natural. It's, it's, silk it's silk a good one as well. Yeah. Silk is a good one as well. For some people, silk doesn't breathe too well, but it, definitely feels comfy. and and on that note of uh the the toxins and things there's a lot of hype to do with um receipts is is there any validation in in that or is that just nonsense like receipts you yes, would get from a exactly, store like after exactly. you make a purchase yeah i hear a lot of stuff about receipts um but this kind of goes it's a big topic it's a can of worms because it's like tea bags you know they say with tea bags, they soak the tea bags in a white dye, which give the white color. Then when you heat the tea bag up, a lot of those toxins will get emitted into the water. It's all these things. And I think there's validity to it for sure. So uh, I, I would say there's some truth to it. I personally haven't looked into it too, too much with the receipts, but I'm sure there's something there. Okay. And sleeping with the fan on, is that something that you recommend? Yeah. For So for some people, it... it there's a lot of personal preference with this. The fan will keep things cooler. So as a result of that, it's really nice. It also acts as white noise. So if you have noise coming from the outside or the white noise provides a safe of um, a sense of safety for some people. So in that way, it can be beneficial too. Um, but yeah, those, those fans in general will also um, 
might be annoying to some people and they they won't sleep well on that. So with a lot of my clients, we'll try it out for a week or two and see how they go. And um, but most most react quite quite good to it. I mean, I'm in Canada now; it's cool, so we don't need one. But the moment summer hits or I'm going down south, I might put a fan on. And is it fine to leave it on the whole time, the whole night? And also, is it okay if it blows on your body, or do you prefer? Would you recommend oscillating or not directly on you? I like the oscillating the best when it's on your body. What you'll sometimes find is you there's all this air going on. You you almost wake up kind of not like almost feeling not winded, but congested or a lot of this, you know, because there's stuff while we sleep, like with our mucus and everything else, it might dry out our, our, our mouth, our nose. So as long as it oscillates, that's typically going to be your best bet or keep it like off you. So you're getting airflow in the room, but it's not directly on you. So there's a lot of variations you can do, but oscillating's generally a good bet let's talk about um, testosterone optimization and cortisol management sure so testosterone there's a couple different areas we have total testosterone free testosterone free testosterone is the one that's bioavailable for our body and total testosterone is important uh we also have sex hormone binding globulin which can make our free testosterone low because it binds to it and free testosterone should be about you know one to three percent of what our total testosterone is if someone's so there's a couple different cases if someone's total testosterone is low then that's a different case than if someone's total testosterone is high but their bioavailable free testosterone is low if their total testosterone is low i would say you know it's a it's a it's a big three-hour conversation but basically the foods you eat can get absorbed into the building blocks that create testosterone. So the question is, well, are those building blocks getting assimilated for your hormones to use? If they're not, there's something wrong with your gut. Um, are your testes, you know, working with your adrenal glands and the pituitary gland in your brain to produce enough testosterone? Because, you know, you have LSH um, and FH and these all kind of correlate with each other as well. So... Um, for a lot of what I will just say, how do we improve testosterone? Going to the gym, getting enough sleep, assuming enough hours of sleep, you can use some of these natural testosterone boosters that I mentioned, getting rid of the sugar, getting rid of the alcohol, getting rid of the junk food. Once we do that, our testosterone is going to be in a very good place. Once we are at that place and our testosterone is still low and we did blood tests and everything, then we can have another conversation. But up until that point, most people aren't doing these things. They say their testosterone is low. They want to do testosterone replacement therapy or something or who knows, going on anabolic steroids. Um, but there's so much you can do on the natural side without taking a lot of these other things. Um, and then if that still doesn't work, then we can fine tune the process, do lab testing, look at these other elements and see what exactly is going on upstream. So there's testosterone replacement therapy as one option. And then there's also the hormone replacement therapy with peptides and those kind of things. So your recommendation yep. is sort out your lifestyle factors first, do the supplementation, do everything in your power. But then obviously, and especially for older people, I'm sure, I'm sure you'd agree, like maybe 40, 50, it's probably best, like at that stage, their testosterone would have declined nat naturally. And it might be if they're suffering from low testosterone, it is actually a chronic condition. And potentially, they must look at other options. Exactly. If those guys who are older, they're going to the gym, they're eating right, they're maybe taking some of the natural supplements, they're doing cold showers, they're doing, you know, sauna two, three times a week, and we look at their blood, and it's still lower than they want to be, or they want to get back to testosterone levels. So when they were 18 years old, let's say a lot of entrepreneurs want that, then that's a conversation to have about testosterone replacement therapy um, to help boost that in that way. And I think in that way, it's good. But the thing is, when you do that, you have the risk of becoming infertile, not being able to have children. So at that point, they may have already had children already, especially when you get older. So someone to do it in their 20s, considering all these other factors that are available, it's, it's in my opinion, at least, it's really not worth it. You want to try everything possible. And only then, and th then you want to try. But if you do everything in your, in your in naturally possible, 
you're probably going to be able to even double your testosterone. Like I've seen it so many times. So those are some epic tips for optimization of testosterone. What can we give the listeners for uh, cortisol management while understanding that cortisol is catabolic, stress is catabolic, it's all really bad. A little bit of stress is good, but overall uh, chronic stress is definitely bad and uh, high stress levels are also probably quite bad for you. Mm. So to keep testosterone, or sorry, uh, cortisol low, stress low, there's a couple different things. One is your perceived stress. Like how do you reduce just the obvious things? How do you reduce stress in your external environment that's triggering this cortisol to be elevated? Is it your job? Is it a relationship? Is it things that you have going on? How do you make systems, build systems in your life so that doesn't have to happen in the first place? Once you get that figured out, you can start then, you know, eating a clean diet. Like if you're eating a, a poor diet, not getting sleep and all these basic things we talked about, your stress is going to go up so much higher even in your perceived stress is going to go up so much higher because everything is going to be out of balance compared to if you had those things figured out. So get the diet down, get the supplements down, get the sleep down. Once you do that, then you can look at things like um, Epsom salt baths, float tanks. You can do spa, uh, cold plunges are incredible for stress. At the end of your shower, a warm shower, spike it to cold for one minute and put the cold on your face, your collarbone, at the back of your head, at the brainstem. These are the most important where receptors are in your body that will trigger a lot of the benefits. And also sauna, steam sauna, dry sauna. Try doing that for five times a week for 15, 20 minutes and see how you feel. You're, and combine that with cold plunges, going to the gym, doing cardio. On a hormonal level and these other areas, you are going to do a lot for stress, cortisol, and leaving time for recovery. And that's kind of all you need. And when you do that, you can still drink alcohol or coffee or whatever you want to do, but you don't rely on it as a crutch to just get to the next day. It's, it's something that, you know, it's based on your own attention where it's not controlling you, you're controlling it. Absolutely. So we're coming to the end of our value packed episode here, but I would like you just to quickly touch on while you're on diet. So just touching more on diet and then uh, basal metabolic rate as well, and maybe your active BMR as well. Sure. So with diet, we want to eat foods, obviously, that we've heard before that are not processed. And don't think of diet as like follow ketogenic or follow this, follow that. All of us are genetically different. And the best way actually is do a genetic test, find out genetically what are the best foods that your body will agree to. Because again, it's a, it's a personalized, unique approach. Find out what your biological blueprint is and then kind of eat foods around that. And don't eat diet for the sake of like three teaspoons of this, three cups of this. That gets complicated. Think about a template. So every meal that you have, you want to have one protein, one carb, one fat, one seasoning. So it could be a grass-fed steak with some broccoli. For the fat, you might have an avocado. You might put on some olive oil on that or like a salad with olive oil. And then for seasonings, you might put on like sea salt with – um, you know, just other things you might mix in like sweet potatoes if you wanted to have carbs that way as a post meal, but balancing those things in a full way is great. The second thing with diet is we want to cut all gluten, dairy, especially grains for people who have sensitivities. Grain can be a massive one. So grains could be granola, porch, oatmeal, quinoa, brown rice. Um, those are big secondary things in diet. It's not for everybody. And I don't want someone to just, you know, eat like rice and rice and chicken all their, the rest of your lives. But having things, for example, like nightshades are a family. So potatoes, uh, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers can be uh, nightshades. No, sorry, those were nightshades. But FODMAP foods can be inflammatory for some people. You can just Google what these foods are. But um, I would just say in general, drink enough water. Drink half of your body weight that's in pounds in ounces of water per day, making sure that water is not tap water. You want to make sure it's filtered, ideally is reverse osmosis, and or making sure it's clean. And then you want to make sure that you have um, whole foods, not organic fruits. You want to make sure they're not spray. They don't have chemicals, pesticides, and stuff like that on them, not GMOs inside the meat and stuff like that buying really good sources, ideally from a local farm. And then, you know, you're, you're going to give your body the right building blocks. Um, and then you're going to be in a really good place. And then you were saying part uh, two to that. BMR. 
So the BMR is your metabolism. A- so your BMRs, yeah. So your basal metabolism rate is basically, you know, if your goal is to lose fat, we are always losing fat or we have something known as our metabolism. And that will not just be on when we're going for a run or doing exercise, which a lot of people believe, but it's actually turn on all the time. Now, our basal metabolism rate is different for everybody. In fact, some people are losing fat while they're sleeping. Other people are not. So you might know some people that are able to just keep fat off while they're sleeping. They don't you know, go for massive marathon runs. They don't just eat salads all the time and they're able to maintain this. Well, there's something to that. The more muscle we have in our body, the higher our basal metabolism rate is going to be. So if your goal is to reduce fat, don't just go for marathon runs because you're probably going to turn into skinny fat. When we run for long distances, we're going to be burning muscle at the same time. So we want to be building muscle up, keeping testosterone up, and then um, uh, keeping our fat low. And how we do that is we eat the whole foods. We, If we got to do cardio, you can do like 10,000 steps per day. Try lifting weights. Try aiming for strength. Um, always each each um, workout, progressive muscle overload. Try and increase the weight just a little bit each um, time you go back to the gym for that muscle group. And you're slowly going to get stronger. You're going to get bigger. Um, depending if you're a male or female or what your goals are. And you're going to be able to maintain that muscle and have a really good hormonal environment that just naturally promotes fat loss and keeps muscle on. Again, the effortless experience of doing all this while we're sleeping, opposed to having to go to the gym, do all these intense exercises or or something else. We make it easy for ourselves by working smarter, not harder. Absolutely. And I think to end off, I would love you to please uh, give, give us that analogy on the car and the human and basically with regards to the amount of time that you need to sleep, for example, for, you said it way better than, I, than I'm going to say it now. So I want you just to rephrase it. Mm. But basically, it was about someone getting nine hours of sleep that might be necessary mm. for them because they are needing more sleep due to high inflammation and inefficient, uh, mm. and it's inefficient, it's similar to uh, like a bad car, whereas someone else might be getting seven hours and that's more than enough for them. You had a really cool car analogy, and I would appreciate it if you could just finish off with that and then any closing thoughts yeah. you have um, or any words of wisdom or advice for, for our listeners. Sure. So the analogy he's speaking of is he asked me, do people need like nine plus hours of sleep? Is getting more sleep actually better than not getting you know enough sleep? And what it is, is this current state of our body, you might need nine plus hours of sleep or eight plus hours of sleep because your body inside is so inflamed and things are happening inside of your body that cause you to need more recovery just to get back to baseline versus somebody else might only need six or seven hours of sleep to fully feel re- recharged because their inside body is just more healthy. It's more efficient. It's able to sleep deeper, not sleep longer, not as deeply. The quality of the sleep is is much higher for them. So as a result, they might not need as much of that um, versus the other person. They require that because their body is just inefficient. And this is similar to a car. Like I was saying, like a car from the 1980s. If your body is running like a car from the 1980s and it's clogged up, it wasn't well-maintained, it's going to need a lot more recovery to just bring it up to baseline versus if your body is running as this efficient machine, you're not going to need as much recovery to fill up your fuel tank. You'll need less because the quality is higher, things more optimized, things recover faster in a shorter period of time. And as a result, when you wake up, you're able to just continue on your day as such. I'm not saying to anyone just you know aim for five or six hours of sleep. It's a general overall philosophy and principle of maybe you need seven and a half or eight hours of sleep genetically. And there's a genetic component too. Some people genetically just need six. Other people need nine. But a massive component is from the environment because their body's internal state is just so poor. And we need way more sleep than we actually we actually do. Absolutely. That's such a cool analogy. And then to finish off, anything, anything mm-hmm. else from your side, closing thoughts? Yeah, I'd say this. A lot of people focus on the external. So they read books, they focus on tips, tactics, all this internal stuff. And that's really important. But in my opinion, I've said it before, focusing on the internal first, because when you when you focus on the internal first, 
by increasing the resiliency of your body, not seeing health as this, or sleep as this thing you just put under the rug and you get on with it and then you can overcome it with willpower. Instead, making that a priority and seeing this as an investment in yourself because when you invest in that, it's going to pay you back dividends in the days, weeks, months to come where you can hit your goals so much faster and those same external tactics that you were doing do you execute those at two out of 10 or do you execute those at 10 out of 10? And if you're executing those at 10 out of 10, then you're going to get to where you want to go from point A to B way faster, way more easily than you ever thought was possible. What a fantastic wrap up. Thank you so much, Riley Jarvis. Thank you, Rascal. I appreciate it. Goodbye, Gains Gurus. Thank you for listening and see you on the next episode of TMGP.